are you? I'm good, good. Marion, I see you. I see you, Fran. And How are you? Bert. Okay. And John. Hi, Fran. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Okay. <laughs> are we about ready to begin? We're ready for you guys. Okay. Well, it looks like we have a 19. I'm going to mute you all. And then when I'm finished, I will come back and unmute you and place it in euros. Questions. Okay. What is 17 in euros, which represented 50%? Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? If you can hear me, wave. You can. Okay, very good. All right. So let's uh, get going. As I said, you are all muted. I'm the only one who is talking now. But when I'm finished in about an hour, 45 minutes, then I'll open it up and you can uh, give me any questions you have. So once again, my name is Ron Brown. I teach history and political science at Toro College. We have a campus here in uh, Forest Hills. I live in Queens. And I also teach world religions at the Unification Theological Seminary. So I have degrees in history, political science, my uh, degree in world religions is from Harvard Divinity School. So uh, I'm going to be talking today on one of the major world religions, and that is Buddhism. Now, on the left, you can see the outline. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, the origin of Buddhism. Like every religion, Buddhism emerged from another religion. Um, and Buddhism is a worldly religion, otherworldly religion, the role of the seeker, fundamental ideas, the Four Noble Truths, the great Buddhist king of India, Ashoka the Great, and then the two current branches of Buddhism that exist in the world um, today. So let's get going. <clears throat> Now, let me make sure I have the right slide. Right. Okay. Now, Buddhism um, is a world religion, and it has a lot of characteristics that are common with all other world religions. For example, um, every religion has a sacred space. Jews talk about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is also important for Christians. Uh, Islam, it is Mecca and Medina. So we have sacred lands, holy cities, um, holy people. Every religion has laws about food, whether it's kosher, halal, vegetarianism, or for Catholics, no meat on Friday. Every religion has rules about what you should wear, uh, castes, Pilgrimage is a part of all religions. Every religion has laws about divorce and family economics. Every religion has a sacred language. For Jews, it's Hebrew. Even if you don't speak Hebrew, Hebrew is going to be part of the synagogue service. For Catholics, it's Latin. For Hindus, it's Sanskrit. So every religion has a, um, a sacred religion. Well, Buddhism doesn't have any of these. Buddhism doesn't have a holy nation. Anybody can become a Buddhist. You're not born into a religion. There are no food laws in Buddhism. You can eat whatever you want to eat, sort of like Catholics. You can wear what you want. Buddhism is a missionary religion. You sends out missionaries. Anybody can convert and become a Buddhist. There's no holy land, no holy places. There are no laws about Buddhist government or daily life. So Buddhism is what we call an otherworldly religion, meaning it's not concerned about this world. It's not building armies to take over holy lands like the Jews and West Bank settlements. A Buddhist would say that is not religion. A Buddhist would say, we are dealing only with 
spiritual matters. So Buddhism is an otherworldly religion. Well, Buddhism emerged in India, even though today the 95% of all Indians are Hindus, but Buddhism emerged in India and Buddhism has very deep roots. Hinduism, which is the major religion of India, is considered the oldest continuously existing world religions. On the map on the right, you see where Hinduism emerged on the Indus Valley River, which is today Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. And Hindus, like most religions, had a very important water religion. Here you see a bathing pool. Water is important in every religion, whether it's the Catholic baptism, whether it's the Jewish mikvah, whether it is the Hindu washing of your face, your hands and your feet before prayer, water is part of every religion and it was part of Hinduism. Now Hinduism, as you probably know, has what we call the caste system. The Brahmins are the priests at the top, Next comes the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors and the kings and the rulers. Next come the Vaishyas, who were the traders, the merchants. Then came the Sudras, the unskilled workers. And at the bottom would be the outcasts, people who have no caste in the system. So Hinduism was a very this-worldly religion. Hinduism was like Judaism and Islam. It told you what to wear. It told you what to eat. It told you what holidays to celebrate. It told you what kind of government you should have. So Hinduism and Judaism, Islam, were very this worldly, organizing a society here on earth. Buddhism, on the other hand, said, I'm not worried about what's happening here on earth. I am happening, I am interested only in spiritual matters. Hinduism had many, many gods and an ever increasing number of gods. This is what we call polytheism. The more gods, the merrier. If you were a good Hindu, well, you chose the god who was important for you. If you were a woman and you couldn't get pregnant, you'd go to the Hindu temple and you would pray to the god, uh, goddess of fertility. If you were a man and you were in business, you'd go to the temple and you would pray to the elephant god, Ganesha, in the upper right-hand corner, who was the god of earthly prosperity. If you were a student, like my students at Toro, you would go to the Hindu temple and you would pray to the god of intellectual pursuits. If it was raining, you would pray to the rain god to stop the rain. So every god had a function and every Hindu temple until today is filled with statues of this god and that god. Hinduism had rules about everything. India was the sacred land, the sacred city of Varanasi. Hinduism told you what to eat and what you couldn't eat, what to wear, organized society, pilgrimage, laws, divorce, inheritance, business. Everything in Hinduism, like in Judaism, like in Islam, was regulated by the religion. Well, it was into this Hindu world that stepped the Buddha. Here we see a map of the Buddhist world today. China is by far the largest Buddhist country. Mongolia, Tibet, Buddhist. Buddhism is down in Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Japan, Korea. The bottom in the middle, Sri Lanka, is a Buddhist country. And a little tiny island of Buddhists on the left over in what is today Russia. These are where the Buddhists are today. 
Well, you're going to ask, wait a minute, if the Buddha was from India, why are there no Buddhists in India? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Because Buddhism was a rejection of Hinduism. Buddhism grew out of Hinduism, like Christianity grew out of Judaism, like Judaism grew out of the ancient religions of the Babylonians. You can't understand a religion without understanding its ancient roots. Now, Buddhism is a religion that has a founder. The BB means building blocks. A founder is important in every religion. Moses and Abraham are considered the founders of Judaism, a personality. Jesus, the founder of Christianity. Muhammad, the founder of Islam. The role of the founder is crucial to understanding the character of a religion. Moses and Abraham believed they were founding a tribe, a people, a nation. And so until today, the Jews say, I am a Jew and I'm something else. People can say, I'm half Jewish and half Russian or something. Because Judaism has an ethnic, a racial component. Jesus, on the other hand, said there is no racism in, in a religion. Anybody can become a Christian. And Muhammad, the same thing. He rejected the ethnic character of Judaism and Christianity and, and said anybody can become a Muslim. Well, the founder of Buddhism was a gentleman named Siddhartha Gautama who was born in 563 to 483. Now the numbers are diminishing, which means it is BC or BCE. People use BC, BC means before Christ. Other people use BCE, which means before the common era. Now the Buddha was born in Northern India. If you see the map on the right, you see New Delhi. Well, turn right at New Delhi and in where it is not today Nepal border area with India, the Buddha was born. He was born into the Hindu Kshatriya caste, meaning his father was king and he would become king. That was his destiny. That was his caste. Nobody else could become a king. He couldn't become a priest because he was born into a caste and that caste would determine his life. So you see the picture at the bottom, there's the Buddha. I mean, you see two pictures of the Buddha. In the middle, you see Buddha with his hand, with his foot on a lion, with a sword. He was a king and he would follow in his father's footsteps as the king. Now, that's not the usual image we see of the Buddha. When we think of the Buddha, we think of the picture on the right, the nice meditating Buddha, the silent Buddha, no swords over there, no dead um, lions or animals under his feet. This is really what the role of the Buddha is all about. He went from being an earthly king to being a deeply spiritual person. Well, like a king, the Buddha was supposed to follow in his father's footsteps. Well, he grew up and as a late teenager, he was required to get married. Here on the left, we see the picture of his marriage. Uh, we see the, uh, the queen Yasodhara. They had a son uh, who was born. This is Rahula. He fulfilled all of the duties of a good Hindu king. He remained king for 29 years. So here we have the Buddha, who claimed to be a good Hindu all of his life, just like Jesus claimed to be a good Jew all of his life. He never rejected Judaism. And so the Buddha never rejected 
Hinduism. Well, one day the Buddha woke up and he was curious. As a king, he was in his palace. He never went out of his palace. No, that's not because they had the, um, the virus going around and he was locked in his palace and had to play video games all day. Back then, the king did not go out of his palace. He was of the Kshatriya caste. He did not interact with people below him. But the king decided he wanted to see what was going on in the world. What kind of people was he ruling over? So he went out on three occasions. The first time he went out, he saw an old person. And he walked up to that old person and he said, what are those funny lines on your face? What are those black spots on your hands? What happened to your hair? And the person said, I am an old person. And this happens to old people. Well, he was perplexed because he had never seen an old person. Any old man in the palace wore beautiful wigs and had makeup and everything. He had never seen old age. The next time he snuck out of the palace, he saw an ill person, a person whose body organs were deteriorating, who was bleeding, who was suffering. And he said, what happened to you? And this person said, I have a disease that nobody can cure. And he said, I have never seen a disease. They was all hidden from me because I'm a kshatriya. I'm not supposed to see such things. And he started really seriously thinking. Well, then he went back to the palace and another time he snuck out and he saw a dead person laying on the street. And he said, what happened to this person? And everybody said, well, he died. And the, uh, the Buddha said, well, what is death? What leaves the body when you die? Well, these things really bothered him. He was wondering, what is this that I am seeing? What is, there, there's something more to life than living a life of luxury in my palace. Well, he was so troubled by this experience of seeing these three states that he had never experienced he decided that it was time for him to explore the world. Well, this is called the Great Departure. He had fulfilled his duties as a good Hindu. He had reigned as king. He had produced a son. And he said, now it is time for me to go to the next stage of my life. So, this was the great departure. Now, this is one of the most important parts in the life of the Buddha. You see it here in these pictures on stone inscriptions of him getting on his horse and riding out of the palace. Well, the legends, of course, multiply. One of the legends was that his horse treads so softly on the cobblestones that nobody could hear his horse. The guards of his palace gates were put into a trance as he went out. Another story is even his wife and his people in his court, he became invisible. And so this is um, enshrined in all Buddhist temples, whether it is stone carvings like the ones you see here, or in a Japanese movie on the right, where you see the young Buddha riding his horse in, in Buddhist countries, they create cartoons, they create movie dramas celebrating the great departure of the Buddha. Well, this idea of the great departure, people leaving their life and going off to explore, is very similar to the Hebrew stories of Moses leading the Jews out of Egypt and wandering in the desert for 40 years where they intermarried and they became a people. 
or Jesus leaving Jerusalem and going out into the desert where he had his spiritual enlightenment, or the Mormons packing up and leaving the eastern half of the United States and building their new city in Salt Lake City after their great uh, uh, period of exile. And so this is very important in all religions, where you have a withdrawal from the society. What did Abraham do? His father was an idol maker in Babylon, and Abraham had his visions, and he said, I must leave Babylon and seek my fortune and my fate elsewhere. So this great withdrawal from a society is fundamental to all world religions. In every Buddhist temple, you'll see pictures such as the one on the left, and you wonder, what the hell is he doing? Well, long hair was a sign of the Kshatriya class. It meant that you didn't have to work. You didn't do physical labor. You weren't in the building trade where you'd be covered with dust. And so when he cut off his hair, the painting on the left, or the ancient stone inscription on the right, the cutting of his hair was a sign that he was moving beyond Hinduism. He was moving beyond the Kshatriya class, and he was moving toward something else. He spent six years exploring all the world religions. Now, Buddhists would say that in his exploration, he explored all the religions of the world, whether they were religions of people, as on the left, where he would go off into the jungle and he would meditate and he would fast for weeks at a time. That's what the starving Buddha looks like on the left. On the right was the well-fed, meditating Buddha, the hand are together in a sense of prayer. He explored every religion on the face of the earth, looking for the reason why do we live? Why do we get sick? And why do we die? Well, it was in the Indian town of Gaya, which is southeast of New Delhi, along the Ganges River that he experienced enlightenment. Here you see him sitting under a pipal tree, meditating, and suddenly the meaning of life became clear to him. And this is the place of the Buddha's enlightenment. Now, today, Gaya, which is now called Bodh Gaya, or the Buddha's Gaya. And you can see it on the picture on the right. Towards the right, you see that little arrow going up, and you see Bodh Gaya. It is in the province of Bihar, which is the most impoverished area of India. When I was there, I mean, you have never seen such poverty as you did in the province of Bihar, but I went and I spent a week in the famous city of Bodh Gaya. So while India today is overwhelmingly Hindu, the Buddhists still maintain their sacred holy city of Bodh Gaya, like the Catholics do Rome or the Jews did Jerusalem. Even when they were in exile, Jerusalem remained important. Well, today, the Buddhist countries of China, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, Tibet, Vietnam, Thailand, all send money to Bodh Gaya to build monuments to Buddhism. On the, right, on the left, we see the tree under which he stood. Now, this is not the same tree, but it is probably the great, 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 great grandchild of the original tree. Pious pilgrims collect the nuts from the tree when they fall to the ground. They take them back to their homeland and they grow a tree from the mother tree in Bodh Gaya. 
Many religious groups build giant statues to the Buddha in this city in India, where today there are very few Buddhists, but it is still maintained as the sacred city of the Buddhists. Now, when I went to India for the very first time, I went to Delhi, you know, New Delhi. I flew there. I went down the river from New Delhi to, if you look closely at the map, you'll see Varanasi, where they have the, the baths, where they burn the dead bodies. Near there is the city of Sarnath, where the Buddha gave his first sermon. And then further along is Bodh Gaya and the sacred city of the Buddha. So once the um, pandemic is over, if you're looking for a fascinating trip, uh, this is the place to go. Now, I always go to India in January. That's when Toro has vacation, but it is also the winter over there, which means it only gets up to 95 degrees each day. So it's very, very pleasant. Now, if you go over there in July, it's going to be 110 insects everywhere and unbelievable humidity. Well, when the Buddha had his enlightenment, he realized the four noble truths. This is the fundamental theology of Buddhism. First is life means suffering. Nobody who has lived has ever escaped old age, disease, and death. This is part of life. Everybody suffers. Number two, the origin of suffering is we want, we are attached to transient things. So a Buddhist would say, if you go out and work 20 hours a day, seven days a week to get rich, that is an illusion. Because rich people, as Bernie Madoff will tell you, you can never have enough money. Every dictator will tell you, you can never have enough power. Nobody can have a house big enough to satisfy them. No woman can be ever beautiful enough. Go to any gym and you'll see these guys who are in phenomenal shape, lusting after even more beautiful body. Well, the Buddha taught that this can be overcome. We can transcend all of these earthly desires. And point four, he proposed the eightfold path in how to overcome all of these earthly attachments. Well, first life is suffering. We're born in suffering, we get old, we get sick. I mean, this is very relevant to the pandemic that is now ravaging the country and the world. Our ultimate goal is death. Uh, suffering is getting what you don't want or suffering is not getting what you want. Meaning we are constantly chasing after material things that in the long term, mean nothing. The old saying, you can't take it with you. I mean, no matter how much money, how beautiful you are, how, uh, most, how powerful you are, for the Buddhists, this is totally unimportant. We are attached to youth. That's why we want, don't want to get old. I mean, um, nobody wants to get old. Why? We won't accept it because we want to be youth. I mean, I've accepted my lack of hair. I'm not gonna go out and buy a wig. I'm not gonna spend a fortune on hair products. I am going to age gracefully, accept it. Now, a Buddhist would say, that's the way to do it. Don't go out and have a facelift, a tummy tuck, and uh, have everything else um, uh, taken care of because it's all an illusion. Attachment to health. Hey, epidemics come and go. I mean, we're not going to be able to overcome them all. Nobody wants to die. Why? Because we are attached to our earthly life. 
we're attached to the status quo. We don't want anything to endanger our social security income. We don't want anything to disturb our nice material lives. And the conclusion was this leads to a total life of anguish. The Germans call angst. This is suffering. So the Buddha said, all of our suffering, all of our discomfort comes from the fact that we are overly attached to material things. Well, what is really important with Buddhism, it said that we ourselves are able of overcoming all of these attachments. We don't need a God from heaven to come down and to tell us how to be happy. We don't need a God to come down and give us laws to regulate our lives. All of this is totally unimportant. So when somebody asks you, is Buddhism a religion? Well, a lot of people would say no, because there is no God. I mean, somebody once asked the Buddha, do you believe in God? And he said, hey, I have enough problems here on earth to worry about without inventing problems about gods who we know nothing about. But Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus were attached to these, you know, uh, people floating around on clouds. We were waiting for the Messiah to come to make everything perfect. We were waiting for Jesus to come to save humanity. The Buddha would say, stop. This stop uh, eluding yourself. Get up and take things into your own hands. Solve your own problems. When you die, it's over. There's no God and angels up in heaven waiting to receive you. So many people would say that Buddhism is not even a religion. I would say it is a religion, but a religion without God. Not everybody needs gods. Christians have three gods squeezed into the Trinity. Jews and Muslims have one God. Hindus have a million gods. I mean, the more the merrier. Buddhists say, oh, let's just do away with all these God figures. We don't need them. We can do it ourselves. We can create a perfect world and achieve enlightenment ourselves. So he proposed eight noble truths eight noble paths to achieve this enlightenment. The correct way of viewing the world, our intentions, right speech, right action, right effort, right mindfulness. Each of these is what a monk does in the monastery. It's sort of like uh, getting a, a PhD where you go through eight years of um, labor. Each one of these is uh, led by a priest. My, I, I love the Eightfold Path, and uh, my father always said that uh, it took me eight years to get my PhD. And so my father always joked and said I was a Buddhist because I drug everything out to eight years. And he said, I was the only person he knew who was going to go from getting a student discount to getting a senior discount, senior citizen discount, without any interruption. But here again, maybe I was a bit of a Buddhist saying, why dash through a PhD? When I can learn languages, I can expand my mind and do it slowly. So this was really the eightfold path that a Buddhist monastery teaches over a period of eight years of spiritual development. The goal of Buddhism is nirvana. You've probably heard that word. Sometimes people call it heaven. Well, heaven is when certain religions believe that you die, you go there. Um, a friend of mine's uh, told me that, you know, he was afraid of dying because he'd have to go up and spend an eternity with his wife and grandkids, and he wasn't too thrilled about that. But in the Buddhist approach to nirvana, you join with the Godhead. You join in the universe. You cease to exist. In fact, the Buddhists would say that even your identity as a you will be overcome and you will join with the universe and you will cease to exist. 
So in many Buddhist temples, you'll see paintings on the wall or inscriptions or something like the picture on the left, showing the eight steps of the path that you take to achieve enlightenment, where you join with the spiritual world and you will cease to exist as a person. And this, in the eyes of the Buddhist, is the perfect identity. There is no sacred land waging wars for holy cities and holy lands. There are no holy nations. American manifest destiny is an illusion. Food, well, God doesn't have to tell you what to eat or what not to eat. You should be able to reach the conclusion yourself caste system, there are no tribes of priests or slaves or kings. And so Buddhism is a liberation from all of these wor worldly objects, wealth, success, even the idea of a self is no longer important in Buddhism. Well, as I said earlier, Buddhism didn't take root in India. It is today in China, Vietnam, Japan, Korea. Well, that's not correct. Buddhism took very strong root in India in the year 304 to 232 BCE or before Christ. A Buddhist king came to the throne called Ashoka the Great. And he united India for the very first time. And here you see the Maurya dynasty uh, as it existed at its high point. This was the glorious Buddhist empire of India, including not only what is today Bangladesh and India and Nepal, but all of Afghanistan into Persia and Pakistan. You may, recent, you may remember a number of years ago where the Taliban in Afghanistan were dynamiting these giant statues of the Buddha. These statues of the Buddha dated from the empire of Ashoka the Great when what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan, half of Iran, India, were all Buddhist. Buddhist temples emerged, great pilgrimage on the map. You see Bodh Gaya, you, where the Buddha had his enlightenment. You see Sarnath, where the Buddha offered his first um, sermon. These black dots are the great Buddhist temples of India, where it flourished for a short while, and then it died out. Once again, the great mysteries of history why did Buddhism die out in its homeland in India? Well, Buddhism spread under the great King Ashoka. Buddhist missionaries were sent worldwide from India up into what is today Iran, into China, Japan, Korea, down into Thailand and Indonesia and Malaysia. And you had the great flowering of Buddhist culture throughout this whole area. Giant temples were built and Buddhism flourished. Well, when Buddhism arrived to a new country, it was transformed. Just like today, we have Roman Catholics and we have German Lutherans and we have Russian Orthodox. Just like today, we have Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe, Sephardic Jews from the Mediterranean and Spain. We have the Bukharian Jews from Central Asia and the Ethiopian Jews, each with their own distinct form of Judaism. So Buddhism spread around the world and took on a different form. So you have many forms of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, each one becoming different when it entered a new country. So Buddhism evolved into many, many forms, some of which we recognize. I'm sure you all remember the good old days of the 60s and the 70s 
when you have Zen Buddhists everywhere. Well, that was only one form of Buddhism that emerged. In Southeast Asia, in Thailand, Laos, uh, Myanmar, which is the old Burma, and in Cambodia, you had a branch of Buddhism which is called state Buddhism, where you had Buddhist kings, you had Buddhist temples built, the picture on the right shows a typical Buddhist temple from Thailand. So whenever you see that, you see that, oh, those are Buddhists from Thailand. In fact, there's a Thai uh, Buddhist temple not far from where I live in Elmhurst, Queens, that is almost identical to this Thai Buddhism. Now, the Thai Buddhists are a religious country. So you have Thailand on the left, on the right, you see a typical Sri Lanka Buddhist temple. Completely different, different architecture, but all were um, venerating the Buddha. Now remember, the Buddha is not a god. The Buddha was simply a teacher. He had enlightenment, he achieved the enlightenment, and disappeared, went up and joined with the forces of the universe. He was not worshipped as a god. He was a teacher, like Confucius. He was, had no divine powers. Well, certain countries until today are Buddhist countries. Sri Lanka, the island at the south of India, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, Thailand is a Buddhist country, Tibet and Mongolia. The official religion of these countries is Buddhism. Sort of like uh, the official religion of Israel is Orthodox Judaism, not Reform Judaism, not Conservative Judaism, not um, uh, um, Central Asian Bukharian Judaism, but Eastern European Orthodox Judaism. That's the religion of the country. So these countries are uh, Buddhists. Tibet is probably the most famous Buddhist country because it's in the press. It is occupied by China and it has a long tradition of Buddhist monks becoming the king. Uh, the Dalai Lama is part of this great uh, tradition until today where the entire country is Buddhist. This is called state Buddhism. Now, these countries such as Thailand and Burma are currently enjoying a revival. Buddhism is coming alive. In Burma, they are expelling the Christians and expelling the Muslims. In Thailand, persecution against non-Buddhists. This is a modern event in Buddhist history where certain countries are becoming militant. When I was in Thailand a while, a couple years ago, the Thai government, which is militantly Buddhist, was dynamiting churches, expelling Muslims, expelling Christians, and this is the rise of Buddhist warfare. This is a recent phenomenon where Buddhism is becoming militant, just like you have militant Islam persecuting Christians and uh, Jews and uh, other people, or the Israelis expanding into the West Bank, establishing West Bank settlements in Palestinian lands. You have the rise of state Buddhism in these Buddhist countries, similar to state Islam and state Judaism, even state uh, Christianity under Donald Trump. So the world is changing and Buddhism is becoming much more militant. Now Buddhism also spread into China. And this is a name which you might come across periodically, and that is called Mahayana Buddhism. And this is the kind of Buddhism which is much more spiritual. 
It's not militant. They don't have terrorists. They don't have armies. This is the Buddhism that we would recognize in the West. This is the Buddhism of the monk. This is the Buddhism of the monastery. This is the Buddhism of peaceful meditation. Very, very different kind of Buddhism than exists in Southeast Asia. Now, when Buddhism came to China, China was already the oldest civilization in the world. In fact, Chinese are very proud to have the oldest continuously existing civilization in the world. The same language, the same culture, the same place, the same cities, going back thousands and thousands of years. Buddhism uh, entered China, but it encountered Confucianism, another religion which was very, very powerful. Well, what did the Buddhists do? They said, okay, Confucianists, you can run the government and we will run the spiritual life. So it is the Buddhism of China, Japan, and Korea that is most popular in the West. The Confucianists run the government. Even if they call themselves communists, they're still Confucianists. And Buddhism deals with the matter of the spiritual world. So you have in China, you can be a perfectly good Confucianist as far as politics is concerned, and you can be a perfectly good Buddhist as far as the spiritual is concerned. So in China, you're in Japan and Korea and Vietnam, you'll meet a lot of people who say, if you ask them, well, are you Confucianist or are you a Buddhist? They'll say, there's really no difference. One deals with government, this world, and Buddhism deals with the next world, spiritual enlightenment. And neither Buddhism or Confucianism uh, have place for a god. I mean, for the Confucianists, the only god worth worshiping is China itself. And for Buddhists, the only god we're worshiping is the spiritual world. So this kind of spiritual Buddhism spread from China. Um, it is the main Buddhism of Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. These are what we call the spiritual Buddhists or the Mahayana Buddhists. Now, very important for Buddhism is the Buddha is not a god. If you go to a Buddhist temple, you're going to see a scene like this on the right with the Buddha sitting there, surrounded by his disciples. Even though the people are kneeling in front of him, even though the people might burn incense sticks in front of the Buddha, he is simply a teacher. Asian religions don't waste their time with gods. Asian religions like Confucianism and Buddhism are interested in spiritual growth. And so the Buddha would say, we don't need a god to reveal things to us. We can achieve it on our own. So Buddhism has many of the aspects of a religion. For example, it looks like people are praying to the Buddha, but they're not. The Buddha doesn't have any spiritual power to give to people. Buddha is not a savior. Rituals are simply ways of venerating a teacher. Sort of like at the end of the semester, when a student gives me a box of chocolate to say thank you. I mean, they're not venerating me as a god. They're just venerating me as hopefully a decent teacher. So in Buddhism, there is no God. They don't have place or reason for a deity. Now this Asian, Chinese, and Japanese Buddhism is what is prevalent in the West. Zen Buddhism is removed from this world. On the right, you see a typical Zen Buddhist monastery at the top of a mountain. When you go to a Zen monastery, you don't want to be worried about politics and economics and all that kind of stuff. You want to remove yourself from the trials and tribulations of this world and enter another world which is peaceful. 
And this is the kind of Buddhism which became very popular in the United States in the 60s and the 70s, and even up until today. I'm sure a lot of you uh, baby boomers might remember the famous book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, meaning an approach to Zen, which is one of pure um, spirituality. Uh, Suzuki in college, uh, when I was there back in the um, early 70s, everybody was reading the Zen books by Suzuki. Here again, sitting in a corner, meditating. This was the Zen Buddhism, which spread to the West and is still very, very um, popular. So with the spread of Z Buddhism, and especially the migration of millions of Chinese and Koreans and Vietnamese to the United States, Buddhism has become part of American culture. It is one of the great American world religions. Excuse me. On the left, we see the largest Buddhist temple in New York City. This is on Canal Street, right on the border between the Lower East Side and Chinatown. And this claims to have the largest statue of the Buddha um, in the United States. And it is uh, the largest temple in Chinatown. On the right is uh, another typical example of a Buddhist temple from Thailand with a rather distinctive architecture. But if you look closely, you can see that both buildings were not built as temples. Like most immigrants, when they come to the United States, they don't have the money to build a big, beautiful temple. So on the left, they rented an old factory building. And on the right, they took a simple uh, home in Queens, added on a little roof temple, put on a decorative entrance, and turned it into a Buddhist temple. <clears throat> now, Buddhism has continued to be of curiosity to many, many people. Uh, uh, tourism. Where you go to on the upper right, we see Bodh Gaya, one of the giant um, uh, Buddhist temples in Bodh Gaya. Nepal is a famous tourism site for especially young people who can climb the mountains and go up and visit the Dalai Lama and meditate in a temple. Uh, Sarnath in India, the ancient ruins of the Ashoka Empire. And above that, we see some of the beautiful um, Buddhist sites, which are continuing to attract millions of uh, tourists to the beautiful uh, temples of India and Nepal. So Buddhism is not a religion anymore restricted to Asia. It is becoming a major world religion. In fact, I, well, last time I was in Jerusalem, a friend of mine, Aura, um, became a, pre, a Buddhist priest in a temple in Jerusalem. Well, of course, the Orthodox were all upset, but the Buddhists simply said, Buddhism is not a religion. We don't have a God. So you can be a perfectly good Orthodox Jew and go to a Buddhist temple, which... Um, for more militant religious people like uh, militant Muslims and uh, evangelical Christians, uh, the idea is not very acceptable. But still, Buddhism it has a charm all of its own, a certain otherworldliness, which continues to attract uh, a lot of people until today. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this PowerPoint. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, remove the PowerPoint and then I will unmute you. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be willing to field them. So I'm going to delete and show. 
Um, stop share. I think that'll do it. Okay. All right. So I see everybody at uh, along the top. Now, how can I unmute everybody? Oh, there we go. Participants. Uh, I'm going to unmute you all. Okay, very good. I hear you all. So, hey. very good. So, do we have any questions, comments? Yes, Ron, I have a question for you. Yes. Being so versed in religions, are you practicing any particular religion? No, I do not. I was raised, I was raised very Roman, like my family is Catholic, but like my family, I've sort of gone embracing all religions. We have, in, we have the Lutheran branch, we have the Catholic branch, we have the Evangelical Protestant branch. We, all, all of my family in Florida is Orthodox Jewish. All my family in New Jersey is everything. And so you can imagine when we have a family, there are at least 20 tables in every corner, <laughs> each featuring a kind of food. And you know, has v'chalil, as they say in Hebrew, <laughs> bid that you should go to the wrong table. So, I, mean, uh, I, I have been a, a passionately interested in religion because it's a very formative part of our society. And especially, you can't understand the modern world today without understanding religion. Whether it is what's going on in Israel, whether it's what's going on in Russia with the revival of orthodoxy, whether it's Donald Trump and the evangelical Protestants, I mean, um, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, you have to understand the power of religion to understand what's going on in the modern world. So that's, I don't know, religion, but it, it's a, uh, a, a, a respect for religion. Uh, I have a question. Yes. yes. Uh, I've heard the expression voodoo. How do you reconcile those two facts? Uh, what were you saying? Okay, could you repeat the question? Yes, I've heard the expression jubu, Jewish Buddhist. How yes. do you reconcile that? Exactly. Well, um, I asked my friend Aura in uh, Jerusalem uh, if she saw any conflict. And she said Buddhism was deeply interiorized. It was meditation. It was self-awareness. There's no God about it. It is uh, closer to therapy than it would be mm -hmm. the religion. And she said, as an Israeli, religion is part of the government. It's not a spiritual movement. I mean, it's West Bank settlements, the Israeli flag with the Star of David and the prayer shawl. So she said, one is worldly and spiritual, and the other one is deeply spiritual. So she, she sees she sees no conflict whatsoever. Thank you. I have a question, if I may, a couple of them. Why is Buddha called the Buddha? And what does Buddha mean? And why is Buddha represented as he is? Okay. Well, um, according to Buddhism, uh, his name was not Buddha. You know, um, uh, he had an Indian name. And he became the Buddha. So the Buddha and Buddha is not a personal name. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. But he became the Buddha. Now, according to Buddhism, everyone and anyone can become a Buddha. And so when we say he was the Buddha, basically we're saying he was the first person who achieved enlightenment and developed a method to encourage other people to become Buddhas. So it is much more a state of being than it is a personal name. Sort of like we would say he became the president. Okay, that's not a personal name. That is a title, that is a status he achieved. And why is he represented as he is? And that describe what you understand is as he is. 
Well, he uh, looks like a person who is sitting cross-legged. And... Right, okay, yes. Now that is the typical position of the meditating Buddha. It's on. His legs one upon the other. Now, when you see a statue of the Buddha, very closely at the hands. In Buddhism, this is called a mudra, M-U-D-R-H-A, usually it's written. And this is the hand position. We saw one picture where he was praying. Another is, he is praying to. And every muda, one muda, he's touching the earth to show that he is uh, bringing earthly enlightenment. So there are about 20 or 30 different hand positions that every Buddha will have a different. Now, I showed you two pictures of the Buddha. One was the, the fasting Buddha that had lost weight. You'll see another Buddha in the meditating position. If you go to a Buddhist temple, sometimes you will see a thousand Buddhist statues. But if you look closely, you'll see that everyone depicts a different state in his life. You see statues of the reclining Buddha, the walking Buddha, the sitting Buddha, the dancing Buddha, each one depicting a different state in his life a different state in his evolution, his spiritual evolution. I have Thank a question. Yes. Many, year, many years ago when I was young, I, I picked up the book by Lowell Thomas, the man who went ahead and went to Lhasa to visit the Dalai Lama when he was a child. And his, his, vo his voice and, and his, his relationship with him was, was incredible. The, if you ever want to read the book, try to get the book on Lowell Thomas and see what he he did and found and found a spiritual awakening within, within that temple. Within and, temple. Uh, and then and then when the the Chinese communists came in and they destroyed Lhasa and they and they caused they caused the Buddha now to leave and become now 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 he's a, a spokesman of a, of a great well of great knowledge and I'm, uh, he's great wonderful. Could you repeat the name of the book again for everybody? It was it was it, I don't remember the book, but it was a, it was written by by a columnist named Lowell Thomas. He was a he was a radio radio commentator who made the trip to Tibet to visit the Buddha in Lhasa, and I wrote a beautiful story and met him. Okay, interesting. Yes, very good. Thank you. I just want to say something about Lhasa. Lhasa was not destroyed, but the communists are doing in Lhasa is very interesting. They drove the Dalai Lama out. And they are infiltrating it with young Chinese Chinese people from other parts of the country to destroy the culture. By intermarrying them, they will destroy the Tibetan Buddhist culture. It was never attacked. They were very right. careful not to do that. In fact, that is very much a part of the Chinese policy: is transferring population to the Muslim regions and to Tibet and to um, dilute the population uh, to such an extent that the Tibetans will basically cease to exist. Yes, that's, uh, Tibet is a major um, issue. Now, um, also with Tibet, don't forget that the Dalai Lama was not just a Buddhist religious leader, but he was also the king of king. Yes. And so when the Chinese wanted to unify the country, they said, well, if you restrain yourself to religious, spiritual issues, that's one thing. But if you remain the king and want independence, that we cannot accept. So it is a very um, complex issue. I think comparing him to a king is a little bit... Um not exactly correct. He was venerated as a spiritual leader and he would be given giving guidance as a spiritual leader, but he certainly was not powerful in the sense that he would go killing people or order people just to arbitrarily obey him. Yes, that, that's, that's true. Yes, yes, exactly. I have a question. Yes. If you go into a Buddhist temple, is it just to go in and pray on your own? or meditate on your own, there's no, 
if there's nobody there running a service or anything like that? Well, um, for Westerners, whether we're Catholics or Protestants or uh, Reformed Jews, we're used to a well-structured religious service at a specific time. Whereas for Asian religions, whether it's Hindu or Buddhist or Confucianist, they don't have a specific time of prayer. So for example, if you go to a Hindu temple, you'll see um, hundreds of gods, a statue in every corner, everybody's doing something different. Uh, you have one woman praying to a goddess because she wants to get pregnant. In the other corner is a woman praying to a goddess because she wants to stop getting pregnant every nine months. <laughs> You'll see a group of students in one corner pre uh, studying in front of a god of intellectual pursuits because they want help for their studies. You'll see a businessman in front of a statue of the elephant god, Ganesha who guarantees material prosperity. Well, it would be the same in Confucianism and in Buddhism. Since Buddhism especially is a spiritual quest, nobody's at the same uh, spiritual level at any time. So if you go to a Buddhist temple, you'll see somebody sitting over in the corner meditating. Another person might be studying Buddhist scriptures. And everybody is sort of at their own pace, at their own level. So uh, if you ask a Buddhist temple, well, uh, when should I come to church? They'll say, well, whenever you feel you need it. And there's no traditional spiritual time. Mm -hmm. A Buddhist temple will have religious leaders, both male and female. Uh, there's a wonderful Buddhist temple in uh, Flushing, Street, where there is a group of about 10 Buddhist nuns who maintain it, and uh, they specialize in helping other women. So if a woman comes in with marital problems or a woman comes in with financial problems, they will help the woman. The emphasis is on women's uh, issues, whatever they may be. And these are celibate Buddhist nuns who are there. Anytime you go in, you'll see a couple over there meditating or chanting or something like that. So for Buddhism and Hinduism and, and Confucianism, it's not as highly structured as it is, mm -hmm. where you have an ordained rabbi or minister or priest. You know, any church will have a Catholic church. It'll be nine o'clock mass, 11 o'clock mass, two o'clock mass, and evening mass. I mean, that you would not find in a um, Buddhist temple. Now, I went to the um, Buddhist temple in, um, uh, on Canal Street, and I know the priest down there, and I was talking to him, and, I said, and he was, he's from uh, China. And I said, what was your most difficult situation when you arrived in New York? And he told me, he said, people would come to him and ask him to do things that he had never done before. And I, because we were part of an American culture. And I said, well, give me an example. And he said, well, I had a couple that came in and they were deeply in love and they wanted me to marry them. And I said, and he said, basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, well, what the hell are you coming to a Buddhist priest for if you want to get married? Go to courthouse, get married. I mean, marriage is not a sacrament. It's not a Buddhist ritual. Uh, that's not what we do here. And he said he had so many American-born Buddhists and immigrant Buddhists who said, they wanted to come to the temple and have a marriage ceremony because that's what you do at, uh, you know, we have a, a, a reformed Jewish marriage, you know, you bring in a rabbi, you know, you go to a church. I mean, this is the way we do things in America. Buddhism is adapting to a very changed environment where he devised his own marriage ritual where he reads from Buddhist prayers and, um, uh, but that, that's totally um, commonplace in Buddhism, but becoming more so in American Buddhism. 
is, is, is the relationship of the movie with Ronald Coleman about finding Shankar Law was that is that basis basic also for uh, was that made reference to uh, the, the uh, uh, Dalai Lama? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Now with that movie though, the the important thing that Buddhists will stress in literature and in movies is the search. And so uh, something like the search for Shangri-La is Shangri-La is a symbol for spiritual enlightenment. It's not an actual place, but it is a, a, uh, a state of being that they are seeking. Okay. Any other questions? Not immortality, though. Is there, is there no. Reason? You mentioned that American Buddhists uh, look for a marriage ceremony of some sort. How would it be done if they weren't American Buddhists? And what relationship and what obligation do they have to each other? Well. My, my best friend here in New York is a Vietnamese Buddhist, but of Chinese origin. His wife is ethnic uh, Vietnamese. And um, for him, when they got married, they basically um, rented a hall. They had a big ceremony. It was a family thing. Now, the... Um, there were no priests or rabbis or anything there. They went to City Hall, and it was a linking between two families. Why did they go to City Hall? Pardon? Why to legalize they... it. To, to legalize well, it. So that, because that in itself is a ceremony. It can be a ceremony. Now, when they did it, they did it in Vietnam. They said they just went to the office and, and their parents came as witnesses. They signed the papers and they okay. But then they had rented a, uh, a banquet hall and that's where the marriage took place. Um, uh, and there was no religious. Now, what was interesting- Let's say it happened in Thailand, not in New York. Same thing. There is no sacramental character to marriage. Now, what was interesting though, my friend's father died back in Vietnam. Well, then when it was a funeral and burial, Buddhism came into the fore. I mean, the 40 days of fasting, the um, money donated to the Buddhist temple, the veneration of the tomb, uh, going back every year on the date of his death for Buddhists, the death ceremony is extremely important. Uh, he sends his kids to meditation school on the weekends. That is very important for Buddhists. And so he said every Saturday, he drives the kids to the, to the temple. They learn how to meditate. I asked him once, I said, well, what do you do when um, the kids are learning meditation? And he says, oh, he says, I go to the sauna and the gym and work out. <laughs> but the kids do the meditation. So here again, the, the, the wedding ceremony. Now that's all, remember when I talked about Confucianism? Yes. And Buddhism. Confucianism deals with marriage. Confucianism deals with things of this world. Buddhism deals with things of spirituality, death, moving on to a higher existence, learning meditation, education is dealt with by Buddhism, uh, government, marriage, because what is marriage? Marriage is a contract, right? It's, it's, uh, it's basically what marriage is about, an ag agreement, you call it a get. You know, um, I mean, it's you, you sign the paper. I mean, even for, I mean, you don't need a rabbi to bless your marriage. I mean, some people have a rent a rabbi if they're not at all religious, but it is a, an agreement between the two families, an agreement between the two individuals. Divorce is not a religious ceremony. So um, Buddhism is very similar to uh, Reform Judaism. 
When we were in Myanmar, we attended a Buddhist wedding. And like you said, it wasn't a typical ceremony. That was, that's a governmental recognition. But there were monks present and the families came together and the monks blessed the, the union and the family. So in a sense, it was a religious wedding, but the state recognizes their own, um, you know, contract. Right, right. Now, I, that's a very important point too, because like I said, uh, in the modern world, um, things are changing. Like when these people went to my friend in Chinatown and wanted a Buddhist monk to officiate at the wedding. He had no idea what they were talking about. <coughs> I said, well, I, I have a good friend. He's a Protestant minister. Call him up and I'll t he'll tell you what to do, which is precisely what he did. And... Uh, he, you know, he did it well, but he said that's not traditionally Buddhist. Now, the big influence, too, in what you mentioned in modern Buddhism is uh, if you are a Christian, you have a big church wedding. And that has influenced other religions, too, where they say, well, if you're a Christian, you have a wedding and the veil and flowers and, um, you know, uh, the, the girls all dressed up and the minister... It has a religious element. So more and more um, Buddhists and even Jews are wanting something more ceremonial uh, to the wedding, uh, not just a family get together and a party. So that is influencing uh, Buddhism um, and especially modern Buddhism. Well, thank you so much, it was wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It's always a pleasure to talk to uh, a well-traveled and an educated group. I'm used to dealing with students you know, <laughs> who uh, haven't been anywhere and don't know nothing. So <laughs> you know, it's a real pleasure. So, and no listening. Okay. Well, I will leave you here. I think we've got- By the way, how old is, how old is the Dalai Lama today? Yeah? He's old. Oh, I'd say he's in his 70s or 80s. That's a good oh, yeah. question. I don't know. I, I'd have to check on that, you know. So he's getting up there. So. Okay. Well, listen, thank you very much, thank everybody. You. It was a real yeah, pleasure. And uh, hopefully I'll see you at some time in the future. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. And be safe. Bye.